Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks to uh, my co-conveners, AACC, uh, WGU, and New America Foundation again. It was a, a great process pulling things together. Um, you know, when I, I've written on competency-based education before, and it always strikes me how much in startup mode it actually is, even though it's been around for a long time. And uh, I think that the systems and policy implications are still very fresh and still very new along many dimensions. And I was really excited uh, in thinking about um, the actual practice that's going on uh, uh, in the context of community colleges and having a conversation with some really smart folks about you know, what they're beginning to see as systemic implications, um, both at the, the community college system level and at the accreditor level and then at the federal state policy level. Um, I'll just do a quick introduction of, of the panelists that are up here with me and then uh, we'll move into our conversation and definitely leave some time for uh, audience Q&A and interaction with the group. Um, I'll start right here to my immediate right with Jay Box. Jay is the chancellor of the Kentucky Community and Technical College System. He, uh, has, he served as a president in the Kentucky, in the, CC, the KCTCS system um, for almost a decade and then before that in senior leadership roles in community colleges in Texas. Uh, then comes Bell Whelan who is the uh, president of the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools and has had th over 30 years of experience in higher education leadership and in just about every different role, faculty member, student services, campus provost, college president, and I believe also an education secretary role. And um, Amy Layton, and, Amy Layton and, uh, deputy director here at New America Foundation of the education program and who prior to this served in the Obama administration, the Department of Education, and I believe also on the DPC, or in the, the White House. The White House. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, one of the things, I'll just, I'll just start with, uh, with Jay. Mm -hmm. Jay, when, you, when your Kentucky is noted as being a, a leader, a leading state at the systems level, when you see competency-based education and how it's playing out in your system, what are your initial thoughts? Where do you think you are? Uh, what are the questions that still arise for, for, for you and your team in, uh, in, your, mem in your colleges? Thank you, Louis. Uh, of course, KCTCS came, uh, uh, came to this conclusion <laughs> on uh, developing a, a competency-based education delivery mode because we, believed, we believe in our community college mission of, of providing access to students. And we found through some surveys that we still weren't reaching the working adult. And most of you that are in uh, community college education know that the working adult is one of the hardest uh, populations to reach. Not only is it difficult for us to find times to schedule classes for them, but it's also difficult for them to uh, persist all the way through a semester due to life issues. And so when we developed uh, our learn on demand competency based model, we addressed it differently in that we said we're going to take all of our 16 week courses and chunk them down into modules that are three to four weeks in length. The purpose of that is that uh, those working adults then could choose uh, to start and if life issues change their agenda, then they could l at least leave us in three weeks with a credit, uh, a partial credit of a course that would then roll up into a full course as they took the other modules. Now, we started this uh, just about five years ago now, and uh, we've seen uh, tremendous uh, growth in this uh, delivery mode. Uh, it, is, it has not seen that our students in this delivery mode have finished credentials quicker, but they have been more successful. And we have reached our target audience in that 85% uh, of the students enrolled in, in this delivery are uh, 25 years of age and older and working adults. So that uh, they are exactly what we were going toward. And I, I think that's one thing is as you determined to go toward a competency-based model that you need to make sure you're understanding what your target audience is because it, it's, it really isn't for every student and we, we're trying to make sure that we're staying true to our vision. Just one follow-on, Jay. So did the, the, the modular system 
it scaled across the whole system at once, the, mod the modular approach? Well, what we did is, is we have 16 colleges and 74 campuses across uh, Kentucky with comprehensive community colleges. And uh, we have a uh, memorandum of understanding that uh, our creditor has approved that allows for if one college uh, delivers a, an online course, then another college can uh, accept that course. Of course, SACS accredits programs. They don't accredit uh, courses, but, but all, we deliver an Associate of Arts and Associate of Science, and we deliver uh, business administration, an IT uh, degree, plus the nursing pathways with a certified nursing assistant, LPN, and RN program within this uh, uh, curriculum, plus an integrated engineering technology degree that will be coming on later on in the late spring of 2014. All 16 colleges can have students enrolled in this model. Only eight of our colleges are actually delivering within this model. Great. Thank you. Bill, um, yeah, I want to move on to you next and see if I can frame this big enough so that you can take it on all at once. Um, you know, as I've been listening to the conversation, I hear uh, a lot of experimentation going on along every dimension of what it is to deliver a higher education. Faculty roles, uh, new programs within institutions, defining competencies in different ways. I add to that, um, you know, initiatives that are um, emerging from outside uh, institutions such as the degree qualifications profile and as an, uh, as an accreditor who is doing the hard work of trying to uh, you know uh, do quality assurance and peer review when all that experimentation is going on just your experiences uh, in working with uh, member institutions in, in your in your area and uh, the challenges you see and opportunities sure. contrary to popular opinion accreditors are not stifling innovation <laughs> um, <laughs> If, if I say nothing else that you write today, please write that. We will be the fourth of the seven regional accreditors who have actually come up with a policy for responding to institutions' desires to have competency-based programs. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, this is not new. This has been recycled. This is my 40th year in higher education, and it's kind of like pointed toe shoes. You wait every 25 years, they come back in style. Uh, the, the difference, I think, is that there is much, um, a much greater need for us to get people quickly employed. Uh, and so to, to get them the skill sets that they need and to, and to have someone certify that they indeed have those skill sets uh, is what's driving a lot of this, and that's not what drove it before. Uh, so that's a big thing. We uh, are taking, uh, so that Broward feels comfortable, we are taking a policy to our board in December that will uh, put the uh, process in place by which institutions would be able to submit their proposals and then we would be able to approve them. And we're concerned about things, um, e even though I, you know, the, the traditional model is still there uh, and this is gonna have to fit that square peg into the round hole, how they do it is what will make the difference. We don't have a definitive way that faculty have to uh, their role has to be defined or the number of hours they have to teach. And so what we're looking for is an explanation on what will the role of faculty be? How will you determine that you have enough qualified faculty? Uh, what is the curriculum? What are the competencies? We've been in front of student learning outcomes since the 80s, so that's, that's not uh, as big a deal. What is as big a deal to our institutions is how do you assess whether students have actually achieved those co uh, competencies and what changes have you made in the institution as a result of those results? That's redundant, but you know, <laughs> you know, because of what you found. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that we will be doing. Uh, Jay mentioned we don't accredit programs or courses. We accredit institutions, but we approve programs and the locations thereof. And so we have to be sure that whatever this model is that surfaces provides the same quality instruction and the same way of a, a same set of expectations or at least a comparable set of expectations for the CBE offered courses as regular courses. There's going to still be that need to um, ensure the accreditors because we then ensure the general public that the, um, the, the oomph 
of these CBE programs have the same oomph that traditional programs do, you know, that they're going to have to learn the same stuff, uh, perhaps through a different modality, but that, that qu the quality of that instruction and the quality of that learning is equal to what we already know out there. Great. Thank you. And um, J Amy, just to round out the, the conversation, put it, a bunch of the issues on the table and then go a little bit deeper. Um, you know, I believe the first congressional hearing we had a, a while back on that we think kicked off higher ed reauthorization really focused on the, trop, the tripartite nature of the way we do you know, regulation and quality in higher yeah. ed, looking at the state, federal, and accreditor roles. And you know, you've been thinking about and writing about competency-based ed for a while. Do you see the beginnings of um, changes in the, those roles? Do you see perhaps at the federal state level? I know that in uh, uh, pr previous consulting work that I've done, that one of the, the questions that continues to arise and it surfaced in the first panel is about, for example, federal financial aid and state financial aid in the, competency of, in the context of competency-based ed and making sure that you're not running afoul of state uh, regulatory rules or uh, calling down an audit from the Department of Ed based on the way that you're, you're developing programs. Do you see a beginning of that evolution happening or is it not started yet? So I do think there's a beginning of that conversation and actually Iris Palmer from NGA is here today and I know she's been thinking a lot about this and what what competency-based education means at the state level and then how you're, you know, how you sort of marry that at the federal level and clearly financial aid, the, the funding of higher education is an important one. So in at the federal level we have mostly up until recently been paying for time, you know, the time-based credit hour rather than learning and now with uh, direct assessment, we're starting to move away from that a little bit, and then hopefully with the experimental sites that I believe somebody publicly said a few days ago, well, there should be a notice out within the next few weeks that invites colleges to apply for these experimental sites. For those of you who aren't familiar with what experimental sites are, they're basically these sort of small, um, I'm just going to call them innovation labs where institutions can waive, uh, or the federal, or the department can waive for institutions some of the financial aid rules and statutes that might be preventing them from sort of doing some of the policy things that we want to do. So there's a lot wrapped up in, fin in fin federal financial aid that's related to time. So there's the credit hour and measuring things by the credit hour. There's also, as people mentioned earlier, academic year. There's satisfactory academic progress. Like what does all of that look like when you take time out of it? And those are questions we don't have the answer to and we need to start experimenting around. And that's great. And the feds are starting to do that. But then, you know, institutions aren't just beholden to the sort of federal oversight, but also to the state. So when you have states that have very specific start times, they have very specific census dates, so you're, you're having to marry those things up. And I think um, it's starting, but nobody's figured it out yet. I think it might, you know, there's going to be a process. But I do want to take this opportunity to sort of take a step back and sort of say it's great that we are getting into the weeds now about how this would look. If we sort of assume that competency-based education is a good thing, how are we going to make it happen? And there's a lot of really, um, you know, sort of weedy uh, regulations and, I mean, there's systems, there's policies, there's, as somebody mentioned earlier, the LMS systems that aren't capable of doing competency-based education. There's all of this specific stuff and we need to figure that out. And I think that's great that we are starting to move that way. What I worry about, and I know this might sound odd since I'm sort of a big proponent of competency-based education, is I worry at the federal level that now we might be moving uh, a little bit too quickly in our excitement. There's so much interest in competency-based education right now that I think we are taking it for granted that we know it works, we know how it works, and we're ready to scale it up. And I don't, I don't think we are. I mean, I, so I say this, you know, getting calls from, you know, congressional staffers all the time, what changes could we make to HEA, right? So I think we need, we need to try to figure out some stuff in order to try to make changes to HEA, but I don't think we know yet what those changes would be. And again, I think we need to sort of step, the sort of premise of CVE is really that it's outcomes based and that it's based on learning and that the learning can be proven and demonstrated. And unless and until we get that part right, all the other stuff doesn't matter. We can figure out how to deliver, you know, a faster, cheaper uh, credential. But we also need to make sure that it's good quality. And that, to me, is um, we have to figure out all the other things. And I, this is not me trying to be reactionary saying, no, no, we don't know enough yet. No, we need to know, which is why we need to experiment. So that's why I'm excited about um, 
the experimental sites and possibly this demonstration pro program that's coming. And I, I hope it allows us to answer both the really specific questions that you sort of ask about how do we, you know, how do we merge these very specific, you know, different operating systems, as it were, but also really get at the quality question. We've all been present at G uh, Amy as emerging as the voice of reason on competency-based education. <laughs> so, um, Jay, I want to come back to you in terms of, you know, talking about the way that you know eight colleges del delivering programs. And one of the things that's interesting, especially since you've gone modular, is in many ways you're creating entirely new uh, learning resources that aren't being developed across the system, but at, within the system. And is the system starting to view itself as almost a learning resource repository that will manage and curate those resources across all the campuses, or are you already that? Right. Yeah, yes, uh, in, in our learn on demand delivery mode, what we did is that the uh, colleges that applied to develop the courses had to put together teams of faculty, and usually from uh, multiple colleges, that uh, develop the courses, dis determine what the learning outcomes would be, the competencies would be, and group them accordingly. And then they developed them in a, into a template where no matter what faculty member was delivering it, it would be delivered the very same way so that the resources, the, what the student would get would be the very same uh, with just the difference with the the uh, faculty facilitator that would bring their nuances to it, but primarily the course would be exactly the same. Uh, and, and as far as uh, textbooks, uh, we went with an e-resources uh, process where we worked, uh, we, where we had the faculty members choose uh, the textbook that they would use and then worked with the d different publishers to have that publisher put it into an electronic format and uh, chunk that down, the textbook down, into only the resources that would be necessary for that module. In some cases, that was uh, quite a bit of material. In other times, it was less than that. But that, uh, that material is always available for the student from the very time that they register for the course. And one of the, uh, we were chatting earlier, and one of the items that you mentioned was, as you began to move to this, uh, to the, the competency-based modular system that there was a lot more cost on the investment on the front end. And can you talk about that a little bit more? Because I think that's really interesting at a system level. I, I, you know, that's, that's where the majority of the cost is, is, is getting everything right up front, uh, the development of the coursework. And remember, we, we approached this that this was going to be a student audience that was totally virtual. We wanted that working adult never to have to come onto our college campuses. So if that was the case, what infrastructure did we have to put into place? So one of the first things we had to do was develop a 24-7 virtual student services model. Uh, several of our college presidents thought they could just hire people. Uh, and I said locking them in the closet at 2 in the morning was not acceptable. <laughs> and so we decided to outsource uh, that, that piece of the Tier 1 services and, and uh, went with Presidium Learning, a, a Kentucky company at the time, and now that's been bought out by Blackboard Student Services, and it's been very successful for us. We, we also had to uh, look at what other kinds of support our students would need in a virtual in environment. And then we established a couple years ago student success coaches. And there's, there's cost to those additional resources for the students, and those are fairly upfront and continuing costs. But once we got the infrastructure in place, our, our delivery cost has actually come down, and we're able to uh, at least break even on, on our delivery now. Yeah. And at the, just one further follow-up, on the system level, do you feel that the way that the system budgets or the way you're allowed to budget under state law, that it gives you the flexibility to do that kind of investment on a repeating basis? Well, we were fortunate enough that the Council on Post-Secondary Education uh, gave us a loan, uh, kind of innovation loan, to develop uh, our first coursework. And then what we did as... Uh, as we started getting into delivery is we set aside uh, some more resources at our state level that could be used for development cost. 
and uh, that fund is always available for the colleges that want to develop new courses or new programs. Uh, and that's helped immensely to have that kind of fund sitting there for development. Bill, as, as you've been going through the, the process of uh, developing, I guess, the, pro the program or process that you're going to bring to your board for approval, what have been either the biggest surprises for you and your team or uh, the feedback that you've been getting from the, the folks, like Jay has participated on that process, I'm, I gather, um, that, you know, raised the, the, the most accreditor-oriented issues for yourself, and are you seeing that, based on the process you're putting in place, it's actually going to, for example, pivot the dialogue or in, in practice or just in terms of uh, the, um, the public dialogue with for example, the Department of Ed about the accreditors' roles, do you see that emerging and changing through the process? Uh, we're not stupid, so we contacted DOE up front. <laughs> uh, after Southern New Hampshire's program was approved by the department, uh, then we wanted to see exactly what it was the department approved and used some of that as a basis for the program that, uh, or the process that we're developing. Um, Jay's organization provides challenges uh, for us because we don't accredit systems. And so uh, his comment that all of the institutions then had to ensure that they, their faculty were involved, that their support services were involved, you know, that they have some say into this stuff. It's a challenge for them because uh, systems are great. They, they have that money. They have that expertise. They're able to bring everybody together. But the reality is it doesn't matter on one level because the institutions have to own this, uh, this new buddy. So um, I, I'm excited about Kentucky's model, and we have, uh, we have uh, thought about what they're doing as well in building this model. Again, um, the thing that surprised us most, I guess, was uh, the variety of, of CBE programs out there and how institutions are defining them. Most of them are hybrid programs, you know, where part of the program is going to be in regular or traditional classes and the other part's going to be, you know, CBE. And so what do we do with that, you know, unique model? It, it, it would be one thing if there was totally CBE and, you know, we could focus on that, but and we have some of those, but dealing with that as well as how this fits into the additional model is providing um, interesting thought for us. And so we're, we're taking a more, initially anyway, until we get a, enough of these applications to kind of ferret out exactly what we want to do, a, uh, an overarching philosophical thing that you need to make sure that these are the areas you address and that you adequately explain what it is you're doing and, if possible, how that relates to you know, the, the more traditional stuff that's going on in your institution. We right now have about five institutional proposals in, uh, and I have very personally asked them to back off until I can come up with a proposal and a procedure so that then I don't have to hear, well, it's taking you forever to do that. Well, yeah, it's taking me forever because I don't know how to do this. This is brand new for us. Um, and they've been willing to do that. So we have those f first five that are willing to be uh, um, subjects for this experiment for us. Uh, and as we get through that, then we'll be able to refine the process. But as I said, we're still interested in, you know, who's going to teach these? What is the role of faculty? How are they developing these programs? Uh, you know, who's, who's the support that's provided? Even if there are coaches or mentors, what are their qualifications, you know, for doing this? Um, you know, who, who put them in charge of whatever it is? What are the support services, whether they're uh, virtual or not? They're, I mean, some institutions don't have that budget. To uh, you know, to provide the um, the 24/7 virtual process, but there still has to be support services that are available. Um, you know, do you see? Um, I mentioned uh, the degree qualifications profile and also the the tuning USA project. Um, do you? How does that fit with this, <laughs> Bell? Or does it not yet? Are they connected yet, or are they not? In some of the proposals, they are. And in full disclosure, I'm on Lumina's board, so I, <laughs> and I just I want to put that out there so nobody wonders why I didn't say that. Um, I, I think some of the programs are indeed uh, rooted in the uh, DQP, especially. You know, the idea that here are the areas, and and these are the things that that need to be uh, covered. We still have the 25% rule that's got to be addressed. That's probably the biggest challenge for us, the one that says if you're going to give a degree to somebody, you have to ensure that 25 percent of the coursework is done, or the, the competencies in this case are provided by your institution, uh, and, in, and that there's a hunk of general education 
uh, competencies that are covered in there as well, because there's a you know the, the large twenty percent of the program, uh, you know, or so is general ed competency. So right now we're dealing with equivalencies, um, you know, and how what what are those equivalencies? Okay. Thank you, uh, Amy. You know, I want to come back to you with to your uh, initial hesitation around policy, because you know what strikes me again as I'm listening is I hear that we're going to end up with a competency based system that's not perhaps less diverse than the current system we have with the credit hour as an organizing principle. And so I'm wondering, do we think that we're going to come up with some, we might just come up with learning outcomes as an organizing principle with similar diversity. So I don't know that that makes the regulatory challenge or the financial aid challenge, it makes it different. Does it necessarily make it better? Well, so, I mean, I would hope CBE would make it better because it's all predicated on outcomes. Will it make it simpler? Not necessarily. I mean, I think the reason that the credit hour has stuck around for so long is because it's easy to organize, right? Measuring time is easy, measuring learning is not. So I don't, my hope is that it will be better. And I think this, um, I mean, it certainly will provide challenges. I think the one thing I do want to sort of disagree with lots of people who've spoken today who says, who have said that CBE isn't for everyone, I guess I disagree, and it sort of depends on how you define CBE. I think, you know, there's different modalities, and there's this sort of learn at your own pace, and there's, you know, there's anytime, anywhere, and there's, there's different ways. But I think fundamentally the idea that students, um, students, employers, schools that students transfer to, anyone should be able to, like, know what students are expected and actually do accomplish, I think should apply to all of higher education. And I think this is where the DQP and tuning come in. I think it's not, you know, it's not just, okay, for these very specific technical skills for those people, right? But it's for everyone. I mean, I think that people go to higher education for a variety of reasons, but at least one reason is because they're trying to learn something, right? We are learning at education institutions of higher learning. So let's try to figure out, you know, how it is that we document that. We, we purport to do that already with grades, but there's rampant grade inflation. There's not a lot of, I think, trust in the grades right now and the credentials, which is why I think we're seeing increased interest in competency-based education, whether or not it's at institutions on the credit side, at institutions on the non-credit side, for employers who are like, I don't want to deal with all the hassle on the credit side, I just want those skills, and it's very competency-based, and it's not for credit. And you're starting to see badges and Cisco certifications and you know alternatives to master's degrees like General Assembly and Dev Boot Camp. I mean, you're starting to see all of these uh, all, all of these sort of alternatives, disruptions, thank you, because I think, as Mary Alice, I think, said, you know, the, the skills aren't visible in what, in traditional or, you know, in, in education sort of writ large, and I think we need to make them visible, and I think that's where sort of tuning comes in, and again, you know, tuning, it can, it, it sort of gets to this idea of external validation, right? It's not just one professor in his or her own classroom setting his or her own standards and measuring against those standards and assessing against those standards, but there's a community. There's somebody beyond that one professor. It may, it may be every faculty member in that discipline, in that college, in that state. I think the, um, I think Tuning has done something with the American Historical Association. Which they're basically trying to define competencies. I believe Cliff can, no doubt, will correct us in Q and Q and A. Um, that they're trying to define competencies for a bachelor's degree in history. I mean, there are ways to to engage faculty as the external um, validators or employers. So, I think that that to me is where all of this becomes interesting is in trying to figure out different ways to really articulate what it is students know and can be, and can do and we we don't really do a great job of that yet and we need to figure it out I don't think there's one answer but I do think that it should apply to all of higher education and not just for I, I think if it just applies to the types of programs that we're talking about that are very technical and very specific it runs the risk of becoming other and becoming sort of two-tracked and lesser and that's not what we want I think at least not I don't think that's what anybody wants. Certainly, <coughs> excuse me, not what I want. I, I think the, the point of CBE is to raise the bar for everyone. Well, so I think CBE implementation is going to be easier than, uh, than we think it might be because of the focus accreditors have on student learning outcomes. 
every academic program in an institution today has to have identified the expected student learning outcomes. And so if you've got that laundry list, it seems like it would be real simple to make them available you know, for students to meet outside of, a, uh, of an institution. And maybe not all, but certainly in our region, all. Um, you know, so I think that's going to be a lot easier. If I might, too, one of the uh, earlier panels was talking about um, arts and science faculty and how our humanities faculty and how you're going to get this. When I go talk with faculty, I tell them my take on this push uh, is threefold. Number one, we were not ready for the impact technology was going to have on jobs. We knew it was going to make some easier. We had no clue it was going to wipe out as many as it did or change as many as it did that people had been able to do and make an honest day's living for their family without a, an extremely high level of education. So that impact was one. My own son was in automotive tech for a while and you don't get your car fixed anymore like you did when I was coming up. You get circuit breakers replaced. That's a very different skill set than being able to turn a wrench. Uh, the second I impact is my generation didn't have as many children as my mother's generation, so we don't have as many people going into the workforce. I mean, they're just not, they haven't been born. And the third one is the largest percentage of people in the workforce are my age who want to retire sooner than later. <laughs> and so you've got that perfect swirl of all that coming together and now we have these jobs that are high skilled jobs with fewer people to do them but who've got to get out there and do them quickly. So we've got to be able to train them somewhere uh, and right now given our system of higher education that's where they learn them in school. And arts and, so and <laughs> Humanities faculty feel better about the sudden focus on jobs, uh, you know, and instead of the education of the individual. I mean, I was a psychology major. I knew I had to get a job. My mom wasn't going to let me back home if I didn't get a job. But it, that wasn't why I went to college so much. You know, that wasn't that in your face why you are. But it is today because we need every able body to be able to perform a skill set that will get them employed. That's great. I want to ask uh, Jay a specific question and then uh, go to one broad question for the group and then move to audience Q&A. You know, one of the things that's always puzzled me as I, as in my own thinking about um, competency-based ed is that especially uh, competency-based ed that's um, really occupationally focused where employers play a huge role in, in identifying competencies is that it, it assumes a lot about how much employers know and how much they're willing to say sustainably engaged in a conversation with the college for changing needs. As, as talk a little bit, if you could talk a little bit about the way that you, the, uh, the Kentucky system has been engaging employers and without, I'm not asking you to knock employers, but just to, to say, do you think that they're up to the task? If you wanted to move to, you know, 40% of your credentials being competency based, do you think employers are up to the task of helping you get there? No. Not <laughs> uh, engagement of employers is important, and I'll, I'll give you an example of what, what we're doing with this integrated engineering technology uh, degree that will be coming online in the spring. This is based on the Automotive Manufacturing Technology Education Collaborative. That's almost as bad as TAC. Huh? <laughs> uh, Amtec is this collaborative that is developing the curriculum that all the auto manufacturers can agree upon is the type of curriculum for industrial maintenance technology and, and again just like the auto technician uh, no longer turns a wrench the auto manufacturer no no longer rivets the uh, the parts together it's it's all very technical in nature and uh, with this grant that was to come about several years ago, we've been putting together this curriculum, and KCTCS is, is the lead for, for this, but there are 12 different uh, states that are involved in the Amtec curriculum. The curriculum is being developed by faculty, but being reviewed by the actual manufacturers and the manufacturers give feedback and we tweak it as we go along. The, I will tell you that the manufacturers are very specific in how often they want to review this curriculum and it's, it's a change for our faculty because they're used to putting curriculum out there and waiting three years or four years and then 
reviewing it. No, the auto manufacturers have said, no, we're going to be reviewing on a constant basis. That feedback has been critical, but it's also slowed us down in being able to roll it out for delivery because we can't get them to draw a line in the sand and say, it's ready. They want to keep tweaking it. So it, it, that's something that we have to balance as institutions is how often the employer will give us feedback because we have to have time to correct it and we have to try it with students to make sure we're delivering something that is appropriate. Great, thank you. Um, I just wanna ask one question of the, of the panel and just you know whoever the panel might wanna take it on and then we'll move to audience Q&A. One of the questions that uh, has arisen over the years around competency-based education and also the use of online ed, and more recently in the, in, uh, within the Beltway policy circles, is concern that, you know, as we talk about disruptions or new approaches and new pathways like this, that, you know, are we going to end up with systems where we have equity issues, where it's, you know, uh, low-income students or students that haven't been or have been traditionally underserved, that they're the ones that are going to be in these, all these new models that we're still testing. And I'm wondering if folks have had time to think about that. Is that a major concern? Uh, is it something that isn't as seen as, you're not experiencing as, as much a concern? We, we've been tracking our uh, learn on demand delivery and the demographics are almost identical with our on campus delivery with the exception that we have 70% females in the, in the program, which is uh, in our traditional format, it's like 55-45 uh, females to males. So uh, we've seen many more females, but as far as diversity is concerned, it's almost identical to our on-campus delivery. Bill or Amy? I think as long as we have options available, then the equity issue will be minimized. Uh, as we've said all morning, CBE is not for everybody. Uh, just like you know, any online program is not for anybody. Any on class, in class program is not for everybody. So as long as we have the variety and students can uh, find the the style of learning you know that best fits them, then I think it'll minimize the equity issues. I'll just reiterate what I said before, which is I think that if we don't bring transparency in what is expected of and actually achieved by students throughout all of higher education, whatever the modality is, whatever, you know, whoever the audience is, whoever the students are, then I think we, I think we already have equity issues. I think a lot of them are masked and I think we need to be much more transparent and that all students deserve that unless until we do that we're going to have more, we're going to have continuing and maybe even exacerbate these equity issues. Great. I'd like to open it up to the uh, audience for questions. Do we have a microphone still? There's no microphone anymore. Uh, Alex should be running. There, there he is. is. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> running in quickly. Okay. We'll, we'll we'll get we'll we'll do Cliff first and get that all out in the open <laughs> right away. <laughs> and there goes the tip. No, I'm not going to beat you up, Amy. You want to read the American it Historical has to be a question, Cliff. Cliff. Hang on. It has to be a question. I have a case of cement brain, Louie, you know that, <laughs> which means concrete examples. We haven't heard one concrete competency statement this morning. So let me give you one, right out of the degree qualifications profile. It's the section on identification and use of learning resources, uh, information resources, something we want students to do at the associate's level, bachelor's, master's. It reads as follows. The student will identify, categorize, prioritize, and evaluate at least two information resources in his or her major field of study. That's a gen generic statement. What kinds of things are we talking about? Wikipedia comes to mind immediately as an example. Um, um, physician's desk reference, chemical information system. You can name a lot of them. At the associate's level, they're at, in technical fields, you've got a whole bunch of them. At the master's level, what the DQP does is it asks the master's level student to contribute to the information resource that's, uh, that's out there. In other words, it's a ratcheting of challenge. Now, now let me go back. We had a discussion about how you assess these things concretely. We don't use the word assessment. We use assignments because it's something that faculty do every week. And if you don't have faculty, you're not going to get this thing. Any competency-based, whatever you want to call it. Here's one that we developed in the late 1970s. Listen carefully. See if you can do, handle this one. And this was at William Patterson College in New Jersey, which is part of the ASCU institutions that we're dealing with this. 
um, in the degree qualification, it's used in the degree qualifications profile as an example of something that deals with um, integrated knowledge and global learning. Suppose a new method, form of energy was developed that when we turned on the switch would slow the rotation of the earth from 24 to 26 hours a day. Before we can flip the switch, an environmental impact statement must be filed. You have a blank piece of paper and 30 minutes and give us the chapter heads and sub-chapter heads of that environmental impact statement. You want something that's concrete, that deals with integrative learning, that deals with global issues, that deals with differential perspective, you just got it. And that's the kind of thing that faculty give every week. And one of the objectives of the whole degree qualifications movement, Bell knows this well from discussions on the Lumina board, is to involve faculty more and more to get more precise about the kinds of assignments they give in relation to what you're calling today competency-based outcomes. And notice the way those competency, that competency-based statement on information resources was, was written. Active verbs, no dead-end nouns, no critical thinking, no awareness, no appreciation. It, those are dead-end nouns. Tell us what students do when you write an information resource. So, Cliff, and can I, I hope turn that into a question for you? Forward, Lewis. Thank you, thank you, Cliff. Amen. So, yeah, so <laughs> I'll, I'll, I guess I'll, put, I'll try to pose that as a question to Bell or Jay and to suggest, is that what you're seeing emerging? I mean, y I mean it, you're seeing that that's the kind of work that's happening on the campuses within your purview and in your systems. Without a doubt. Yes, uh, and within this system, what, uh, we've had several workshops for our faculty who teach in, in, in this environment to how they can develop authentic assessments. Uh, ev every course starts off with a pretest that uh, Kayla like this that starts off with a measure of prior learning. If the student can show proficiency, uh, they can immediately jump to the to post test. And if they pass the post test, they get the credit for the module and can move on. As they're moving through a module, they might have three or four test along the way, but what we're working on is make sure those assessments are more authentic and can apply the learning more than just a, a multiple choice type test. And it was on that basis that I said that it's, it might be easier than we think it is on many levels since institutions have already identified expected student learning outcomes in every program they offer. We have a summer institute that uh, this coming summer will be the uh, 11th one that we will have had that is designed to help faculty, one, identify a student learning outcome uh, and to write it in an active form, and secondly, how to assess it, and third, how to use the results of those assessments in improving the program. And uh, we have, uh, have limited to 700 people every summer. This coming summer we'll have 1,000. Uh, so there is definite interest in it. Um, another question from the audience? Uh, right up here. Thanks. Um, Evelyn Gansglass from CLASP. My question is for uh, Dr. Box. My understanding of Kentucky system is that for years you've had partial credit or that actually you have, even in the workforce arena, you don't have non-credit anymore, that it's all in smaller chunks of credit. And you were really, first of all, is, is that true? And then how has all of that work really related to what you've been talking about, about online instruction? Th the way you were talking about it, it sounded like competency-based instruction was equivalent to online, when in fact there's this whole body of work that's been going on in trying to connect non-credit and credit education. And just could you talk about that a little bit? You're, you're absolutely right. We, we've uh, chunked down our curriculum several years ago, but the purpose of that was primarily for workforce training. And uh, we deliver um, at least half, or if not more, of our workforce training in a credit environment. And so we had to find a way to do that, and, and that way was to chunk down our curriculum to meet the demands of, of an employer who wanted us to bring in just a specific training module for those folks. 
So we've been delivering that in a workforce training environment, but we weren't delivering it in an on-campus environment to credit students who were there uh, for a traditional semester. It was through the online delivery of Learn On Demand that we were able to find a way to deliver it in these chunks and it makes sense to a, a, a student who is going toward a credential. Okay, another question from the audience? Uh, right back there, the gentleman with the beard. Thank you. I'm sorry to monopolize with the second question, but Cliff and I both come from New York and that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for Jay Box, uh, Brooklyn Cliff, um, for Jay Box, a question. You talk about coordinating with employers. Um, AAC and you has done a number of surveys that show a strong commitment on the part of employers to broader kinds of non-technical skills. Um, some of us are questioning whether that's lip service or reality in terms of programming. And I'm wondering if in your employer feedback you're seeing that kind of commitment to broader liberal arts skills or are they focused on the technical? Technical. <laughs> uh, technical primarily, although you, you, you've heard the comment about the needs for soft skills or whatever you want to call them, and that's the, that's the, the major dialogue. And you know that gets us into an area about how are we going to accomplish that? You, you, want, these, you want these students through programs quicker and do directly into the to workforce. And in Kentucky, a student can go into a first level certificate in a technical program, <laughs> and if they're not college ready, they've tested developmental ed, they can skip the developmental ed sequence completely because it's not required in that first level certificate. So we've had to say, mm, we can't be turning out these folks uh, even with a first level credential if they, if they don't have basic math skills, reading and, and writing and communication skills. So what we've been doing as part of the Accelerating Opportunity Grant uh, is that we've been working on contextualizing the, those reading, writing, and, and math skills and, and team teaching with a developmental education or adult ed in, education instructor in the classroom with the technical instructor. That is really pleasing the employer because we're having folks come through with, with both sides uh, both skill sets. However, it's it's very expensive yeah. and very difficult to do. And uh, we're looking for a way to sustain it. So if you know of any multi-billionaire that wants to <laughs> contribute a lot of money for us, we'd certainly take it. Uh, we have time for one last question from the audience. Uh, right, gentleman right there to you. Hi, Jarrett Cummings with Educause. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to the importance of sustained dialogue between the institutional academic leadership and institutional technology leadership in making uh, competency-based education not just possible, but um, successful. We're looking at you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, well, I will tell you that uh, seven years ago, six years ago, when we started this initiative, I was the vice president over technology. And I drove this initiative from the technology side first. Uh, and the, we, we wanted to make sure the technology could do what the academic side of the house really needed. And, and you have to have that, that clear expectation for both. And because I started on that side before coming over to the uh, chancellor's role, uh, it, it helped me understand the importance for that constant communication back with the, uh, all the, the technology folks to make sure that we were uh, collaborating and coordinating our efforts. The big challenges with any kind of program like this is, uh, of course, we, we are a PeopleSoft environment. We had to get PeopleSoft to be able to understand chunked environments, chunk, and how we're going to start any time and end different sequences and how you do that. And now our, our technology folks are so excited about it. We're talking about the, the new transcript that we're going to start developing in the next year, which aligns the competencies with the courses and will actually uh, display it. And that's something that our 
technology folks are thrilled about this. Oh, we can do this, we can do that. That's the kind of innovation you really need is, is your technology folks working with your academic folks to make this happen. Yeah, that's actually a great way to end. I think that the, uh, the uh, changing technology, in particular technology infrastructure, uh, uh, in partnership, in tandem with the academic evolution is really where the heart of CBE is, is coming. It's going to look different in different places, but those two together actually is, is critical. So I want to thank everyone for joining us, and if you join me in thanking our, our panel, thank you very much. <laughs>